Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending the uh, next session with the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series. Um, I'm just going to pop up for a minute while I check for any last minute registrations. And I'm going to present a few slides from the sponsor in the meantime. So I'll be back in just a couple minutes. Okay, and so let me welcome you again. Uh, let me start the slideshow. Okay, so welcome everybody to the Confronting Hegemonic Ideas speaker series. You've already heard about our sponsor here. Uh, there's a disclaimer from one of our sponsors. And I really like uh, one of the quotes of the Heterodox Academy, which is great minds don't always think alike. The speaker series is hosting six events from January to June, 2022. Uh, we've had it on Zoom, but we do have viewing rooms available on the UBC campus. There's also a disclaimer from the Counseling Psychology Program. They say that these ideas expressed by these presenters may be seen as controversial by some individuals and confronting in some ways. The Counseling Psychology Program supports the free exchange of ideas and respectful open debate consistent with those ethics codes listed there. The ideas expressed by the speakers are their own and no endorsement by the Counseling Psychology Program or their, of their views is offered or implied. So the purpose of the speaker series is really to increase awareness of heterodox viewpoints and inconvenient facts and findings that do not conform to hegemonic narratives and dominant perspectives in order to promote critical thinking intellectually rigorous research, and the ability to serve a broader range of counseling clients. After each talk, 
um, the room for people attending in person and viewing in person will remain available for to engage in formal discussions. And at the same time, since most people are attending online, I will in the chat send a separate Zoom room link. And so afterwards, if you wish to stick around and have more of a group discussion or a small group discussion around what you've heard in the talk, that separate Zoom room will remain open for that way. It's a great opportunity to not only express your perspective, but also get an opportunity to practice your ability to learn and listen to people who hold different perspectives than you. And so after every talk, we usually have a small number of people who do stick around. And so remember, there will be a link that's going to be put into the chat. And you need to copy that link while the talk is on. At the start of the talk, copy that link and have it handy. And as soon as the talk is over, I will open up that separate Zoom room for people to attend. So the speakers are guests at the University of British Columbia. And this is a great opportunity to model intellectual and cultural humility and respectful engagement with speakers who present heterodox and unconventional scholarly and evidence-based research perspectives. I'm not going to go through the specific ethics codes, but we believe that the speaker series is completely in line with the ethics codes for psychologists and counselors in Canada. Uh, we've also asked to put in a content advisory from the department. Uh, over the course of the speaker series, you may encounter some perspectives and research evidence that some people may find extremely uncomfortable or disturbing to think about and very challenging to process with an open mind, open and scholarly mind. Some other people may feel exceptionally confused and some may feel validated and invigorated because they now realize that they are not the only ones to think this way. All these reactions are common. We want you to feel protected as you take risks and venture into any areas of extreme discomfort, confusion, or upsetness. We encourage you to talk it out and process your thoughts and reactions with colleagues and peers you feel comfortable with, with and if you're a student in our program, with counseling psychology faculty such as your supervisor or myself or with a counselor or psychologist. These could be very difficult conversations to have, but they also hold potential to spark considerable growth as a person and professional. Preparing you to become a versatile mental health professional or researcher and maximizing your ability to serve a wide range of clients who differ greatly from you requires exposure to and making sense of ideas and evidence that can threaten your belief systems. It also requires you to practice the person-centered conditions of empathy, unconditional positive regard, and genuineness, as well as intellectual and cultural humility. Now, I just uh, briefly want to share one of the reasons or the impetus for starting the speaker series. And I know we have many people who've attended all the talks, and so I'm not going to go through this in the same level of detail I have in the past. And so if you're interested in these slides, you can always uh, let me know. But because a lot of people have heard this before, I'm going to go through it rather quickly and apologize for the first time attendees. Essentially, one of the reasons I started the speaker series was for reading this article. And this article actually sampled social service program graduates and found that when they graduated, went off into the world of work, they were surprised at how unprepared they were to work with individuals who differ greatly from them, economically, politically, ideologically. And when they came across people who really differ greatly from them in their professional roles, they were uneasy, they had strife, and even felt guilty and they recognize the incongruence with their value of being civilly engaged, yet maintaining largely homogenous ideological networks. And I'm just gonna share a couple quotations from the participants in that study. Sarah from that study said, sometimes turning on Fox News or reading different articles from different places, and although you may vehemently disagree with it or think that it's not true in any way, or whatever you make, you may think about it, it's still important to read those things and interpret those things. Understand where people who have different views are coming from. Understand what their arguments are. I think that could not only help you empathize and understand those things, but also in terms if you were having a disagreement with somebody, it also helps you understand where they're coming from. A quotation from Thomas says, I started running into people that had opposite views than me, and I was not necessarily prepared to have those conversations. It's easy to have productive conversations with people who have similar views to you, but it's very hard to have those same productive conversations when people do not have the same views as you. And Stephanie said, I think university for the most part 
maybe a few times in university, but for the most part in general, university didn't necessarily prepare me for real conversations about ideological differences. So what I really want to have is our students prepared for working with uh, people who differ greatly from them and being exposed to different perspectives that they don't commonly hear on university campuses is important to that. And I have many other examples of this, particularly related to counseling in particular, that I'm happy to share if you back channel email me, I'll let you know. Uh, but with that said, uh, today's speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Bates. And I am going to stop my sharing here and give her a formal introduction. Dr. Elizabeth Bates, who is a chartered psychologist in the UK and an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society, is currently a principal lecturer in psychology and psychological therapies at the University of Cumbria. She also serves as a trustee of Mankind Initiative, a UK charity supporting male victims of domestic violence in England, and one that runs a helpline for male victims of domestic, violence, domestic abuse, as well as for their friends, family, neighbors, work colleagues and employers. Dr. Bates' main research areas are around domestic violence and aggression, especially as pertaining to male victims. She has authored about 45 journal articles and has co-edited a very impressive book entitled Domestic Violence Against Men and Boys, Experiences of Male Victims of Intimate Partner Violence. Okay, so with that said, I will turn this over to Dr. Bates. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's really good to be here. Um, I will just share my screen. Start beginning. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can uh, see that, but please shout if not. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really good to be here um, and it's really good to be able to share some of the work that I've done around male victims of um, domestic violence and kind of consider a little bit around the implications that there are for theory and practice. Um, so as I've been introduced, my name's Liz and I'm from the University of Cumbria and I've just put my email address and my Twitter on there in case anybody wants to get in touch after. Um, I'll pop them on again at the end. So in terms of um, what I'm hoping to cover today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about obviously the existing literature that there is on male victims' experiences of domestic violence. And I'm going to set that a little bit in the context of where the research in this area evolved from to kind of highlight the reason that their experiences haven't always been part of the mainstream narrative. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how their experiences can continue and change post-separation and how it can move into the ways in which it can impact on fathers, the impact of these experiences and how men cope with this. Um, and also talk a little bit about some findings from a recent project about domestic homicide reviews. So in terms of the context for anybody that's not as familiar with this area of research, um, domestic violence was basically routinely ignored in the UK, the US and Canada up until around the 1970s. So domestic violence as terms and as it, it's not that we didn't think it existed, we knew it existed, but it just wasn't something that we talked about. Um, it was an issue that actually the suffragettes did take up when the suffragettes were um, starting their movement, but it was obviously um, overtaken at the time by the fight for um, votes for women. So it was mentioned then, but we then entered what um, Don Dutton from Canada um, calls the age of denial, which was up until around the 1970s and 80s. The sanctity and the privacy of the home were valued more highly than the protection and the safety of the people that were in it. So we didn't talk about domestic violence at all. There are different um, analyses and stuff that's been done. So there was a book that was written um, called Bleak Houses. Um, I was I was going to include the link and I forgot to do that, actually. Um, and that was a really interesting analysis of where somebody had been back through a lot of the Dickensian literature and sort of looked at and pointed out all the different instances where we could see there was abuse within the family home. And it was never sort of referred to directly, but it was talked about like somebody would come in and had a black eye or there was an argument or something. So it's something that we've known about for a very long time, which is not talked about up until sort of, as I say, the 1970s and 80s. So the feminist movement and the women's liberation movement in the 1970s can be credited really highly with bringing about an awareness of domestic violence and bringing domestic violence and words like domestic violence and abuse into the public narrative. Obviously, the, the movement in and of itself was about women's liberation and tackling gender inequality. So there was a huge focus on empowerment of women and stop, stopping sorry, wife abuse and fighting against marital rape. Yeah. <laughs> 
So this movement was incredibly important in terms of overcoming the issue of privacy and actually raising the profile and really getting people to care about and want to fight against violence against women. So it's an incredibly important part of um, the time in terms of that research and the policy and how we talked about it in terms of how we started to talk about it moving forward. Because this came from a gendered movement, because it came from something that was very much focused on gender, as I say, and was fighting for rights for women, it was focusing for gender equality and against gender inequality and male privilege. As a consequence, the focus of the initial research that was done in this area was very heavily focused around gender. So because of where it's come from, the gendered model of partner violence and domestic violence really emerged in this area that focused on gender as a cause of domestic violence and started to focus and construct domestic violence as this idea of being gendered. Now, for anybody that's not familiar, be talking about it being gendered or being gender-based, um, in this instance, as I've included a quote here from the European Institute for Gender Equality, is that gender-based violence against women means that violence that is directed against a woman because she is a woman or that disproportionately affects women. So because the model was focused on this, it's very much sort of had that focus on men's violence towards women. And the hypotheses that come from this, so the things that we derive from this model and from this theory, have been very much that violence is directed by men towards women overwhelmingly. That there is that women can be violent, but that it is typically in self-defense or in response to being abused for a number of years. That the causes of this violence are gender inequality and male privilege and patriarchy, and that men use violence and physical violence as just one way in which they can um, try and dominate and control and take power over women. And because we live in a patriarchal society, this model holds that actually we still see this as acceptable and that we don't condone violence against women as much as we should as a consequence. So this model really kind of captures this idea of men's violence towards women. And that was very heavily how it was focused at the time, as I say, because of where this came from. But we know that, and we've seen across that time as well, instances of male victims or an emergence of male victims. So Susan Steinmetz wrote a paper in the 1970s called The Battered Husband Syndrome. So where we'd started to talk about domestic violence and really brought those to, that terminology into the public narrative, um, she started to talk about the fact that actually this is something that happens to men. She highlighted a number of instances across different media and things like um, comic strips, the way that um, there's always this idea of a woman chasing a husband with a frying pan and that there were these little instances that had pointed to the idea that men could also be victims but that the stigma and the shame associated with it meant that they didn't tell anybody and that they had those barriers to help seek him. She pointed as well to something called the charivari, which is a post-Renaissance custom of public humiliation that is used to enforce social conformity against people who transgress or violate um, the social norms that exist within a community. So the charivari, and this is the picture that's on the slide here, if anybody's ever heard me talk about this before, because um, I know some of my students are here, um, this, is a, this is a picture I often use. So this is an example of one of these practices, and this is, um, I think it's from France, this particular example, where we have a man that is basically um, dressed in a stupid outfit, made to ride around the village backwards on a donkey, while people are heckling him and publicly humiliating him, often um, shouting, um, not shouting, sorry, making noises with animal horns and things to kind of point to this idea that actually um, he's also must have been cuckolded. So this was a this was a public punishment for any man that had allowed his wife to beat him and so therefore threatened this order of patriarchy that existed. The problem with the fact that we know that these, these victims exist, we know that there has been these instances of it across history, we can see the reference to it. The traditional models that I've just introduced, that gender-based model, doesn't allow for male victims or what I would I would call very, I hope you can see my inverted commas, genuine male victims. That model only allows for male victims in as much as women using self-defence because they've been abused themselves. And uh, Michael Johnson, 
is an American feminist researcher. Um, and this is a quote that I um, was in one of his books where when a woman slaps her husband in the heat of an argument, it is unlikely to be interpreted by him as a serious attempt to do him physical harm. In fact, it is likely to be seen as a quaint form of feminine communication. So completely dismissive of women's violence and a whole host of other things here, which annoys me. But the early models of domestic violence just don't allow for male victims and the idea that a woman cannot use violence in this way or that it is trivial or that it's not impactful is a narrative that really runs through the history of how we've looked at domestic violence. But within the sort of, again, the late 70s, early 80s, there was a sort of separate parallel body of work developing. So those domestic violence model that's focused on gender, that was the start of this huge body of work that looked at um, men within perpetrator programs, men in prisons. It looked at men who were violent and it worked with women who were in refuge or in victim services or um, how it was impacting on them and their children. So this was this massive body of work that started to develop because of what that feminist movement did in terms of introducing these terms. So we, look, we know so much about women's experiences from that body of work. But from this, there was also this separate sort of parallel body of work that was developing that looked at um, domestic violence less as something um, that men did to women because of gender and looked more at actually does this happen in families is this something that we see within families so they took a different approach so where that domestic violence within the gendered framework was using what I sort of loosely call clinical samples i.e women in um, refuge or men in services or in prison and um, the other sort of body of work that was developed by people like Murray Strauss started to actually work with community samples and rather than asking about domestic violence, they were asking about conflict in relationships. And it was used to develop something called the conflict tactic scale, which was one of the first act based measures. So where we ask about not about a, you know, a thing like domestic violence, but actually about behaviours. So conflict is very normal in relationships when you and your partner fall out. These are a list of things that could happen. How many times did you do this? How many times did your partner? Excuse me. So on this, it was things like um, discussed it calmly, argued all the way through to sort of um, explosive aggression. So indirect aggression or physical violence, as well as other sort of subscales that were developed since. And actually, this research was really key in highlighting not only that women could be violent and that men could be victims, but also that this happened within same sex relationships as well and within relationships in the wider family. So there was real criticism about this research at the time because it was seen as ignoring the context and the impact of domestic violence. And one of the quotes that sort of used quite a lot at the time was this idea of a slap. A slap isn't equal to a slap, i.e. if a man slaps a woman and a woman slaps a man, typically due to their you know, stereotypical size and strength differences, that the impact isn't the same. Or if a woman is slapping her husband after years of abuse, that is not the same as a man using that um, violence as part of the control. So a lot of the criticisms around this research focused on this idea that actually, well, yeah, okay, you're saying that women do this and that men can experience this, but it's not the same, is it? So from that, it's only really been over the last 15 years that there's been a much greater in-depth exploration of men's experiences and their needs. And so this body of work has been really key in us understanding the way in which men can experience physical abuse. So again, a lot of the perceptions that come around and a lot of the stereotypes point to this idea that well, a man can't really be hurt by a woman, can he? Or surely a man can defend himself. But actually the research that there is, so the first sort of research in this area, in this sort of really in-depth looking at men's experiences, was done by um, Denise Hines and some of her colleagues. So she, um, as part of her team, they looked at um, analysis of from 190 male callers to the domestic, the domestic abuse hotline for men which at the time was the only hotline in America that was um, just for men, just for male victims and has since closed down because there wasn't enough funding for it. Um, so of those callers, this idea then that men don't experience it in a significant way, over half of the callers had indicated that they were fearful of injury from their female partners. And the most common types of violence, as you can see listed there, were slapped and hit, pushed, kicked and punched. So one of the, um, that was a really excellent study and there's so much good research in this area, but what they've typically relied on is help seeking samples. 
So like, for example, that one, um, interview based samples. So I'm talking qualitative research now, sorry. So the numbers, we know about the numbers from that huge body of work that I just mentioned. But in terms of that in-depth qualitative understanding, we've relied on these help seeking samples, interview based studies, which really requires somebody to sit across and, you know, and talk in, in that way. So like that's quite an uncomfortable situation sometimes to talk about sensitive subjects. And also um, studies that are advertised for victims of domestic violence. So for men, men are less likely to seek help. They're less likely to recognise their experiences of domestic violence as domestic violence, because that's what happens to women. And they're less likely to want to actually talk about it. They find it harder to disclose so as a consequence, and because of the work that I've done with Mankind Initiative, which is that male victims charity, um, they have an anonymous helpline. And that helpline, um, I think it was the last data that was collected, I think it was around 72, 73 percent of the men that had called only called because it was anonymous, because they didn't have to give any identifiable information. So I wanted to draw on that to try and do some work that would try and capture a wider range of men's experiences. So the study that I've done that I've listed here and that I've sort of shared a few quotes on across the slides was an anonymous qualitative online survey. So it allowed for the anonymity and disclosure. And I asked about aggression and control from a female partner. I didn't use terms like domestic violence. And it was advertised sort of quite widely on social media and things. So there were 161 men that took part in that study. And I asked the question about whether they'd ever told anybody before. And 25% of the men that took part had never told anybody else about their experiences. So I know from that that I've captured a little bit more than some of the other studies have in terms of that breadth of experience. So I found it to be a really particularly um, effective methodological um, choice in that way. So anyway, from that study, um, you can see I've got some slide, um, some quotes sorry, on the slides here of examples of physical abuse that they'd experienced. So again, there was lots of indications of things like slapping and hitting and pushing, but there were also really serious injurious level examples of violence, as you can see here. Um, one thing, sorry, just to mention, I knew I was going to mention something else, um, was that um, obviously serious violence often using weapons not necessarily weapons like knives and guns and things but using like you can see from the first example tv remotes and ornaments to hit and also they were typically uh, not typically sorry but commonly sorry attacked while they were asleep or they were in the shower so when they were vulnerable so one of the things I kind of discussed in the paper was perhaps this idea that where women are aware that their size and strength is not typically as great as a man's physically then actually perhaps they are using consciously or unconsciously strategies to overcome that. So just to point to the um, an aspect of injury, um, so there's a study that was recently very um, lucky to be part of that was done in the US that utilised some data from the system that you can see there, which was basically hospital emergency department data, where they used, they analysed um, data that was collected that was um, injuries due to domestic violence. So this is a really um, unique data set in terms of the way in which um, we analyse men's experiences. So men's um, experiences and, and injuries and that sort of health related adverse outcomes hasn't been captured before. So this was a really exciting project to be part of. So again, men are less likely to seek help and the research does suggest less likely to be injured than women are, but they were still made up 17.2% of the men that presented with IPV, so domestic violence related injuries to this emergency department over that 10 year period. Intentional striking was the most common reported mechanism for both men and women in terms of what they'd experienced. The second most common but for men was being cut or pierced or stabbed. And that accounted for 28.1% of all of the injuries where it was a much smaller proportion for women. And when men, sorry, were significantly more likely than women to have been cut or pierced, as well as to have been bitten, run over, burnt, shot or as, as the causes of their injuries. Women were more likely to be seen um, when they if, has, having been punched or struck and then or fallen. So obviously from those figures, women are more commonly presenting, but male victims that were presented were more likely to be admitted 
as in so they were attended but then were admitted to hospital which indicated I think that the men that were seeking help here were potentially pushed by the fact that their injuries were more severe so that men only seek help basically when they have to around that way so their injuries are so severe that they're having to. So this pointed to some really interesting data that came out of this study. So in terms of other forms of abuse, <clears throat> excuse me, sexual abuse and sexual violence is again one of the most, I think still one of the most taboo topics when we talk about men's experiences, particularly when we talk about men being sexually assaulted or sexually abused by women. So the stereotypes and the misunderstandings around anatomy, physiology, biology, um, a lot of different sort of perspectives that we have lead to the assumption that women can't force men to have sex if they don't want to. But the literature definitely supports that this is possible. Now, within the UK and England and Wales specifically, the legislation around sexual violence is very much around, um, sorry, the legislation, I beg your pardon, around rape is worded in a way and uses language that means that within that legislation, legally, a woman can't rape a man. Instead of that, it's recognised within sort of other um, sexual violence, sexual assault sort of elements of it. So they, it is still there and recognised, but not using that same language. So as you can see from the statistics on the slide, um, both American and in, um, British data there shows that men do and have experienced unwanted contact sexual violence from intimate partners. And again, <clears throat> utilising some of the data from the study that I just mentioned, um, I worked with somebody called Siobhan Weir, who works at Lancaster University in the northwest of England. And she's done a lot of work around men's experiences of being forced to penetrate. So this is how we have the languages here, because we, again, we can't use the term rape. So being forced to penetrate by women. So she's looked at that generally, regardless of sort of relationship with perpetrator. And I've obviously focused on men's experiences of domestic related violence, so violence within that context. So what we did was we took data from both of our data sets and we looked. So I looked for where there was sexual violence. She looked in her data for where there was domestic violence related themes. We basically pulled it together and, and looked through. And again, you can see here from the quotes on the slides that with really significant sexual violence that was experienced by men, either being um, assaulted, uh, physically being threatened, being taken advantage of in terms of either somebody that's in pain or having taken a sleeping tablet, um, the threats and stuff, the manipulation around contraception as well. So there were really quite significant experiences of sexual violence within both of our data sets in the context of domestic violence. But again, I think this is still one of those taboos that I think we need to overcome. And then psychological, emotional abuse and control, sort of language that is used to describe what are very broadly similar behaviours. And again, that original Denise Hines study, 90, nearly 95% had said that there was control in behaviour within those relationships, including coercion and threats, emotional abuse and intimidation. A recent study in the UK working with uh, Mankind Initiative and um, Professor Graham Kevin and Deb Powney did some work with and um, they have a mas massive international survey actually of men's experiences but utilising just the UK based men they found again significant themes of coercive control and emotional abuse within that data and again I could see that within my um, data as well. So of the 161 men, not all of them reported physical violence, although there was an, a, a significant majority that did. But they all talked about themes around control, emotional and psychological abuse, whether it was around things like finances, whether it was around um, social isolation and not allowed to see friends and family, whether it was, as you can see, about some of these examples here about threats against children. Um, one that I always remember that was so sneaky in terms of it as a tactic was that a man described that his girlfriend had gone into his phone and changed just one digit in all of his friends' phone numbers. So it looked the same, but obviously they weren't getting through and couldn't get in touch, but he didn't know. He just thought they'd stopped replying or that they weren't answering or whatever. So, and again, just that pattern of behaviour that led that man to be really isolated from his social connections. And one of these um, particular areas of coercive control, which I think we're starting to talk about a bit more now, um, and again, has been talked about a little bit around women's experiences before, 
and I think has become entered into the public narrative around a range of different social issues now, this idea of gaslighting. But gaslighting um, comes from the film Gaslight that was released in the 30s, where a man used, um, well, he was basically trying to drive his wife insane, um, so she would be sent to an insane asylum and he could get all the money. And he would do things like turn the gas lights down. And when she would say, oh, if you turn the lights down, he'd say, no, you must be imagining it. You're going mad, you're going crazy. So gaslighting is this idea of where people can be led to believe um, that they are going mad, to lead to um, doubt their sense of reality and that they don't really know what's going on. And where this wasn't a term that all of the men had heard of, I included like a little explanation. Um, a lot of them described it as being something that they recognised. And it's kind of, part, as that first quote alludes to there, it really fits with actually when you have got a range of other tactics that have left a man to become socially, or a woman, I hasten to add, to become socially isolated, when there is just that one voice in your ear all the time, it's really a lot harder to challenge because there's no other sort of input in that way. And there are other sort of research going on as well, just drawing on um, and, and sort of looking at the ways in which it can impact on specific groups of men. So I'll talk about fathers a little bit later on, but I just wanted to point to um, a, a study that we were involved in looking at older men. Um, so looking at men who were 60 and above within that larger data set that I had, we looked to see if there were any particular areas where there was... Um, different types of abuse almost or abuse that was related to the fact that they were older and Nikki Carthy who I worked with on this she'd done a lot of work with older women and had we there is quite a significant body of um, literature on older women's experiences of domestic violence it is conflated a little bit with um talking about elder abuse but that's a sort of separate conversation um, and as you can see here we saw that there were um there was still physical violence, there was still coercive control as per everything else I've just been talking about, but there were also specific related manipulations that were specific to the fact they were older men. So the first one really gets me about the idea that actually somebody had tried to convince him he had Alzheimer's to try and force him to sign a paper. Um, related to pensions, related to age, related cognitive decline, lots of different aspects there that were really used as a tool for control. So it's all well, um, you reading it out, but one of the things that um, from that first study that I did with some colleagues at the university was take some of the quotes and have them read on a little video by men, not men who had taken part here since they were the men that I work with. And I know that some of my students in the audience will probably recognise some of the voices on it. Um, but the quotes are from my data set. So they're real genuine quotes, but they're read um, aloud. Let me just... She just came up behind and stabbed me in my um in my left arm and that cut all the way through my arm and came out the other side. Um and then I had two more further stab wounds on my back. Blood was going everywhere. In the evening after any argument, uh always as I was about to fall asleep, she would bring up the whole argument up again. I soon learnt to just apologise for anything and everything because if I didn't, I wouldn't be allowed to get any sleep. I opened my diary and she'd placed a letter in it stating that she was pregnant and had come off the pill deliberately. I felt totally violated. She kept telling me that she would kill our children and me if I ever left her or if I did not comply with whatever it was that she wanted. I mean, the first time, I've got a perfect sort of slow motion video memory of it. I was sort of just sitting on the sofa. Um, it was about six o'clock at night. The TV was on, but I wasn't watching it. I was just sitting there with a the drink. And she just came in and punched very hard on the nose and, and I bled and then she went back into the kitchen again. I mean, I suppose that the worst examples of physical abuse are the things like, I was driving the car when the eldest two were quite young and we got into an argument and she just kept punching me in the head while I was driving the car. I couldn't do anything because I had to keep driving the car. So I'm just getting punched in the head. I have two children in the back. You know what, if she punches me unconscious or something, and I'm bleeding after all this. They'll be slapping, scratching, pushing, pulling, blocking your exits from a room spitting, sometimes kicking, throwing things. 
the whole time was like walking on eggshells because you didn't know which version of her was going to come through the door after work or whatever. You didn't know if it was going to be the nice one or the, the not so nice one. I was raised to never, ever, ever hit a woman, so I never fought back. I just covered my face and backed away from her the best I could. I'd have to bring proof of purchase for milk when she would send me to the shops and ring her when I was in the shops to prove that I was there and only there. I wasn't allowed to take my daughter to school because of all the single mothers there. She once injured her hand. She punched me in the face too hard and she broke her pinky finger. And uh, we went to the doctor's office immediately and the doctor called it a boxer's break. Then the doctor offered for her to press charges against me and she made sure that I knew about that when we got back into the car. She said that the doctor has gave her his card and that any time that she wants, all she has to do is call this doctor and the doctor will help her press charges against me for the assault. And I said, but you hit me in the face and broke your hand on my face. And she said, it doesn't matter. And she used that as a threat all the time. And she said, all I have to do is call the doctor. She also used to say that all she has to do is put a bruise on her body and just bang herself against the door jam or something. And she just has to say that I did that. The relationship's over for two years now. I still don't feel like I could trust another person to form a new one. I'm heartbroken knowing there's nothing I can do to help my son. I'm still in court fighting. She totally manipulated the relationships I had with my own family, trying to avoid contact with them or not seeing them, and feeding me negative comments about them all the time. It's so obvious now with hindsight what she was doing. But it was gradual, you see. Like the frog warmed up gently in the pan. You don't see the abuse of the relationship creeping up and taking over you. I tried to kill myself. I ate all the sleeping pills I could find, drank a bit, and was happy that it was over. I woke up next to her. It was the worst moment in my life. I was still in hell. The worst example was a night when she doused the bed in paraffin, set fire to it with me asleep, turned the power off, and waited by the switch with a hammer. I have never attacked her or fought back at all. I have tried to restrain her at times to prevent her from attacking me. The problem in that is that she would then show me the bruises a couple of days later and tell me that she could report me to the police for assault and that they would believe her story. Unfortunately, that is true. It eventually got to the point where I would just cover my face and not even try to restrain her. She also subjected me to several ordeals of sexual torture. She stole a pair of handcuffs from the, from the prison where she worked. And the first I knew about it was waking up to find myself handcuffed to the metal bed frame. She proceeded to torture me and then got infuriated because I was not getting an erection, obviously too terrified and in too much pain, and gave me a good punching and left me there. I, I have no friends now. Uh, my wife insisted I stop socialising as I was now with her. And if I loved her, I would not want to spend time with anybody else. Um, so I'm incredibly proud of that um, in, ter like, in terms of the fact that this was suggested and, and made because I think that actually hearing those words from another man's voice really gives um, gives life to it. That doesn't sound like they're a particularly good way to word it, but I hope you know what I mean. So the impact of these experiences is really significant. We know from the wider literature that men suffer um, physical health problems and injuries from their experiences of domestic violence and that they can experience mental health problems that are associated with it as well. The issue we've got within the wider literature has been that we have typically, historically, compared abused men to abused women. Now, I'm a bit uncomfortable ethically with making that comparison because I'm not sure how you then use that who's got it worse kind of scenario. Um, but really, as well, it's not an appropriate one. We should really be comparing abused men to non-abused men because women and men, histor well, I say historically, sorry, the, the literature suggests that we deal with our psychological distress differently. So women will be more likely to internalise that distress and so report higher levels of things like anxiety and depression, whereas men are more likely to externalise it. And so we'll report higher levels of things like alcohol um, use, substance misuse and risky behaviours and things. So it isn't always a fair comparison to make anyway.
But again, within some of the literature that I have, um, as you can see, one of those quotes is from that video as well. Um, there were significant experiences of physical injuries, um, even wider range of sort of um, mental health issues like anxiety and depression and PTSD and PTSD type symptoms. But also the isolation and the fact that these men had often been isolated from their, fam their friends, their family, their social networks also meant that there was that element of that um, impact as well. So being isolated and being alone. So how can this sometimes continue post-separation? So unfortunately, the stereotype sort of indicates that when an, a relationship ends, the violence would end, but that isn't the case. And we know that there is evidence of continued abuse and harassment of women. Um, we know, for example, that the time immediately after breakup is a particularly dangerous time for, for women. Um, that perception of rejection is thought to um, or can lead to escalation. So that period um, is the most common time for a woman to be um, murdered within that context. Um, the literature that looks at custody disputes and divorce, we see the way in which you um, people can continue to exert that control. And um, a Canadian data set actually from um, quite a while ago now, 20 years ago, the Canadian General Social Survey revealed that of the people within that survey that had experienced um, domestic violence, 40% of women and 32% of men had reported that some of it had occurred after the end of the relationship. And for some, it had only actually begun after the end of the relationship and for others, it had escalated. And we also know from the wider um, statistics and literature around stalking um, that men can experience this type of um, abuse and harassment. So um, domestic stalking by a partner or an ex-partner, because partners and ex-partners are the most common type of stalker, shows that actually for every four victims of stalking, three are female and one are male. So quite a significant proportion. So again, what um, myself um, and Dr Julie Taylor at the university and some of our fantastic students did was we explored the way in which post-separation, um, well, sorry, we explored the way in which abuse can continue post-separation. So from the big study that I'd done, there was a small sample um, that I did follow-up interviews with to ask about post-separation violence because it had come up so many times within that sort of wider data set, but I hadn't had any questions specifically asking about it. So I'd done a small follow-up interview study um, that's, that indicated a range of different ways in which it could continue. And so then myself and Julie and our students then used a similar method, so the online anonymous qualitative survey, to again explore the ways in which men experienced this on a wider scale. So there were significant experiences still of physical violence, not, not to the same proportion because that lack of proximity often reduces the opportunity for violence in that way. But there was violence, as you can see here, significant and often injurious, serious violence, but also the exertion of coercive control through either, for example, threats like that first, uh, well, sorry, the third quote down sort of alludes to the threat of making false allegations and um, the stalking and harassment type behaviour from that last quote as well. And again, the impact of this type of violence was also really significant because I could only like kind of like, liken it to the, this idea that actually if you've battled for it and overcome so many barriers and hurdles to get out of an abusive relationship and then that abuse continues, the impact of that must be incredible. So again, many mental health sort of um, outcomes that were reported, um, PTSD and PTSD type symptoms again. But for the men that were fathers, it was actually the pain of not seeing the children or the impact it was having on the children that was the most um, unbearable and the most painful. And the quotes at the bottom there, you can see also the way in which it impacted on the wider family as well. So kind of just to bring it on to fathers, um, the traditional family structure historically, you know, if dad goes out to work, mum stays at home, looks after children, that traditional family structure has obviously not historically facilitated father's involvement in the same way as mothers. And I think that this perception involved, um, has sort of informed a stereotype that fathers are less invested in their children, um, that they're less involved with their children, or that they're not as important to their children as the mothers are. And the research has demonstrated that actually the importance of the father's identity to individual men predicts their level of involvement. But where a man's identity and as, a, as a father is very central to him, this may create an opportunity for this to be manipulated. 
non-resident male parents within the sort of wider custody disputes and, and parental literature, non uh, sorry, non-resident male parents have described the loss of the partner and the access to the children as leaving them at a loss and being almost like grief. And that estrangement that can occur either through alienation, which I'll come on to in a minute, or through genuine estrangement, um, also impacts massively on psychological well-being. So I have worked with Ben Hine, who is from the University of West London, um, and we've looked at men's experiences of um, parental alienation. Now, if you've heard of the term parental parental alienation it's a controversial term because the evidence base is weak it is a lot of it is anecdotal the studies that are in the area are not great I'll be honest so the the sort of the stigma that comes with the terminology is quite damaging to us understanding the the experiences more broadly but when we look at the way in which men can become alienated from their children or have that relationship withheld or manipulated so when we focus on the actual behaviors that we see it is very clear within men's accounts that this occurs so myself and ben we asked about actually the impact of this and what sort of things were happening as well as where it fit within that wider context of domestic violence um, we could see that actually during the relationship men were being um, influenced or manipulated around when they could have that contact with their children um, this then continued after separation so for example withholding contact or manipulating the times or having activities clash with those times. So there are a number of instances of the ways in which contact, contact was controlled, sorry. We also saw this manipula manipulation, sorry, let me take back in. This manipulation occurred through systems, so using legal and administrative systems. So for example, the criminal justice system or the family court system or schools. So using false allegations, breaching court orders so not maintaining when they were supposed to have contact etc and the issue with that in particular is that actually they're, they're in certainly within the UK there's very little um punishment doesn't feel like the right word but actually there's no real enforcement of this so if they breach those court orders there's no penalty so there's not really any deterrent from doing that and really damagingly as well, children were used as part of that manipulation and as part of that abuse, whether it was through changing the names of the children, so changing their surnames, or whether it was, for example, not calling him dad anymore in front of them and always calling him by his first name, or for some they were calling new, step, new partner dad, or whether it was sort of denigration, humiliation, constant, you know, putting the father down, or lying and sort of telling telling the children things like that last one at the end, um, telling the children I spent time at work to get away from them. So one of the thing, one of the quotes from my original study that had really made me want to look into this aspect further had been um, a man that said that his wife had told his four year old daughter that she, that he had killed her dog, and that he wanted to kill her and her sister. So that, as an example of a way in which then that child becomes terrified of her father because of what the mother has said. And just to be really clear, this is something that definitely happens that men do to women as well. But it's so detrimental to that relationship and to those children and to those men. So actually, how do men recover from this or move on? And I use recovery in inverted commas for a reason. Um, so another study that I've done, I feel like I'm just listing the studies that I've done, but, um, but using quite a different method here um, was to look at the ways in which men coped or recovered after the end of their abusive relationships. So again, working with Dr. Julie Taylor from the University of Cumbria, we did a photo elicitation study. Um, and alongside that, we wrote a guide about how to use photo elicitation because we didn't find anything that had currently done that within the psychological literature. But using photo elicitation is basically using photos within an interview setting or using visual stimuli within an interview setting. And it's known to be really um, well, it's known to be good for a number of reasons, not least of which being it promotes um, deeper, more emotional connections to memories, as well as it often being, um, it can ease anxiety within that interview setting. 
So we'd asked men to sort of bring photos to represent what their experience had been of recovery after the end of their relationship. And one of the things that came out of that massively for me was this idea that there is no recovery. And that's where, and I put this, we put this in the paper as well, because I, I kept talking about recovery, but recovery implies some sort of return to a former state, which we know didn't happen for these men. So we really sort of challenged ourselves on the language that we used. And there were a range of different factors that had come out of this analysis. We did a thematic analysis on this. There were a range of different factors. And we used these photos alongside the data to kind of um, talk about it. And so I just wanted to share one example here because I know I'm already running out of time. Um, and this photo was one that he um, brought and said it was the only, well, you can see from the quote there, the most powerful physical representation of that grief that he felt from not being able to see his children. So the absolute hollowed out grief, the statue itself is somewhere in Europe um, and it was actually created by somebody designed, sorry, that's not good language choice, um, by somebody to represent um, grief, which I think very, very powerful representation of that. But using these photos alongside the interviews gave such an incredible insight into these men's experiences and really allowed them to tell us their story without any of our, like without me or Julie asking the questions, bringing our assumptions and our knowledge to it. It was all just handed over to them and they told us their story. So one of the things that is really important to kind of link in with all of this is the fact that men um, men face a number of barriers to help seeking. Now, broadly speaking, we know that men are less likely to seek help across a range of different areas. For example, um, health related stuff, um, going to the doctor, all of that sort of thing. But there are three different ways in which we felt, and Julie and I sort of had, who have again done a bit of work together, and um, really felt that men impacted were or were impacted, as I say, by this. So the fact that domestic violence generally is a stigmatised identity, being a victim of domestic violence is something that has been talked about across the, the women's literature as well. A lot of the models talk about it as a stigmatised identity. The fact that the stereotypes and the narrative is still very much that women are victims and men are perpetrators and the really powerful long-standing discourse and narrative in policy and practice that points to the fact that men are perpetrators and women are victims and supports that dyad. So it's almost like men are trebly stigmatised um, and really face a number of barriers from when they're trying to seek help. When they have um, found help they often report that the sources are unhelpful or that they experience gender stereotyped treatment, which has the potential for um, secondary victimization. So this includes examples of being accused of being a perpetrator, um, being given a helpline to ring, ringing it and finding out that it's a batterer or a perpetrator program, not a victim program. So there are a number of different um, barriers that men face in terms of their help seeking. And so an exploration that Julie and I did looking at this, again, using that very similar method of this on anonymous online survey to find out not only about the experiences of people who have sought help, but actually those who have never sought help, what are the barriers they're experiencing? And ultimately you can see here, a lot of it came down to the fact that as men, it was a very stigmatized identity and gender that they experienced. And that impacted on their barriers to help seeking as well as the responses to that initial help seeking. So the range of, of themes that came out of this was really, really interesting. And I just wanted to share a couple of quotes here really, because there were a range of those barriers that they seemed impacted in terms of how it was impacting on their children. The children for fathers were the biggest barrier for help seeking. They didn't want to leave them there. They were frightened of not seeing them again. They didn't know what would happen if they weren't there. So these really did inform a number of different barriers. I'm really aware of the time now, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. So what, this kind of brings me on, and I'm not going to talk about this in much detail as I was going to, around the perceptions of victims. So I think that, again, another barrier that we have around help seeking and another barrier that stops men disclosing is the fact that we don't see men and women as victims in the same way. We assume that women can't hurt men and we assume that men can easily defend themselves. We use expressions like man up and get on with it and don't cry like a girl and imply that these experiences are trivial and don't impact. 
Um, I also just assume that it doesn't have the same adverse consequences for men, which we can see from some of the stuff I've already presented that that isn't the case. So I'm not going to show this video, but for anybody that's interested, if you just search for Violence is Violence, Mankind Initiative on YouTube, it's just about a three minute video, but it's a social experiment where they have um, the, the actors in it, the two people fighting are actors, everybody else and their reaction is real and genuine and the reaction to the male and female victims is, is very different, but I just really recommend that you look at that after. But the reason that this is important really now just to kind of bring towards the end of my presentation is that actually it impacts on the way in which men are treated within services when they do ask for help or when they do try and get that help. They often face those barriers and those judgments and those perceptions from people in these services. So some work that um, one of my dissertation students did that we've recently published was to analyse what we call what's called in the UK a domestic homicide review. So it's basically where there's been a, um, a homicide and there's been a known history of domestic violence within that relationship. There is a review done to basically work out what we've what what went wrong, why wasn't it stopped, what lessons can be learned. So we focused on um, a number of domestic homicide reviews, 22 between 2015 and 2020, where a man had been murdered by his female partner. And these were a range of the themes that were seen within the data. And I'm just going to kind of point to a few of them now. But when men were presenting at healthcare settings and in hospital, there was a lack of exploration of where these men's injuries had come from. So in this example of somebody who was fatally stabbed, there was a real lack of consistency in the stories that were being told by himself and his partner at the time. Um, and yet no further action was taken. So he had been stabbed and he said it done it. He said it was her. He said he did it himself. There was nothing consistent about his story, but they were just released with no further action. And that meant that man was later stabbed to death. Linked to that, there was a dismissal or a lack of exploration of where there were multiple incidents. So five of the 22 men in these reviews had been to hospital many times. But none of those men who went to hospital were ever questioned alone away from their partner. Women that present at hospital with violent injuries like that are always questioned alone and are always asked if it is domestic violence related. Now, I understand why historically we haven't done that with men because men are more at risk of injury and violence in a range of other settings. All the statistics suggest that. But to not then actually ever question a man on his own to ask those questions is, for me, not acceptable. And as you can see from the quote here from another domestic homicide review, if um, she had presented in this way, so if, her, if his partner at the time had presented with the same injuries, she definitely would have been spoken to alone. So there's a real recognition within that review that he was treated differently because he was a man. Where there were, so across this 22, I haven't really talked about bi-directional violence today, but bi-directional violence is a really common pattern of violence seen within domestic violence relationships where you can be a perpetrator and a victim within the same relationship. Where there was bi-directional violence in these, um, in these different case studies, and the police were only ever in treating the men as perpetrators and men were much more likely to be arrested than their female partners were. So they were more likely to be arrested and they were much less likely to be seen as a victim, which meant that there were fewer risk assessments done. There were fewer, su less support offered, only ever treating the men as offenders. So it shows the way in which these perceptions that we have of domestic violence really filter down into the narratives and the perceptions of the people that are on the front line and dealing with victims. And this is, again, another issue we have that is a barrier for men getting access to help and support. And there was, again, a lack of provision and resources acknowledged. So there was an explicit acknowledgement within these reviews that there's just not enough done to support men, whether it's about the fact there are no agencies that are specifically supporting them or that policies and practice within different organisations, like the NHS is the National Health Service here, um, that there's not enough acknowledgement within this policy that men can be victims to. So basically across this, what we saw was that men are not treated as women would have been if they were presenting with the same risk, the same injuries and the same experience. So there were real missed opportunities here for risk assessments that could have prevented the future fatality.
The stereotypes and these gendered perceptions that we see across the public narrative were seen within these settings and were affecting the treatment of men from the criminal justice system and from healthcare settings as well. And as I said, there were real missed opportunities to talk to men. So direct questioning is crucial for many abuse victims regarding disclosure, but even more so for men. There's a range of sort of research now that supports that giving men the space to disclose, so giving them that time, asking them if they're okay, is there anything you want to talk about? That's not enough. Direct asking, is everything okay in your relationship? Are you frightened to go home? You know, asking very specific, obviously in a safe way, but in very specific direct questions are important for men to be able to disclose. And I've got a range of different examples of where that's the case. So I'm sorry, I'm going to really draw it to a close now. Um, what does this all mean, I suppose, for, for research and practice? For me, it's about there being a real need for inclusivity around how we talk about domestic violence within the research and within practice. Now, I'm not a fan, I'm not an advocate of gender neutral. We can't ignore gender in society. It is too, um, what's the word? Like it's too built in, it's too ingrained. We can't ignore it. So what's better instead of ignoring it is to try and be inclusive of it, but also potentially responsive to it. So recognising that men and women will present differently, people within the LGBTQ plus, plus community sorry, may present differently or have different barriers that they experience. But being able to provide a response and a support mechanism that is inclusive for all of these groups is really important. And for me, that involves really explicitly challenging some of the stereotypes that we still talk about. Um, a paper um, on victim services that I did with Emily Douglas in the US, we concluded by identifying that there is a need for policy and legislation that is inclusive in name and in spirit. So, for example, within the UK, there is a violence against women and girls strategy, and that is where the domestic violence um, legislation sits. So where there is a gender neutral definition within the legislation, it actually sits under a gendered framework and some of the guidance with it still is quite gendered in its, in its discussion. So it may be that domestic violence is in name, um, you know, gender neutral acknowledges anybody can be a victim, but actually it's not necessarily backed up with that sort of inclusivity. And we basically need to ensure that actually there is the same level of that uh, Mark at Mankind is the chairman of the Mankind Initiative. He always talks about there being the same level of professional curiosity, i.e. if you're worried or you suspect something, ask again, safely, obviously, but applying safeguarding procedures, applying these sort of training in a way that is inclusive and actually trying to treat men and women that are presenting in a similar way the same not the same necessarily, but at least providing those opportunities and really trying to sort of engage more men within these services around things like safeguarding and um, domestic violence support. And the last kind of quote that I've got here is just something that it wasn't specifically related to men, but it was in a paper that I read and it's really stuck with me, which is that there is a still a narrative within some of the literature that actually you're lucky to find the right person to speak to. And actually, we really shouldn't be in a world where that's the case now. Actually, it should be that it doesn't matter who you find, um, they're going to give you that help and support. But it made me think of a documentary that was on the BBC a couple of years ago in the UK. Um, it, I think it's still available on iPlayer, um, called Abused by My Girlfriend. Um, and he was a young lad that was abused over a period of time. And when he was, um, basically when he finally got help, he was about 10 days away from death because she wouldn't let me eat. Um, but the police officer in that documentary was so persistent. He kept, he kept going and Alex kept saying, no, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm fine. But he knew something wasn't right. And his persistence effectively saved that guy's life. So actually really kind of having that sort of, you know, persistence, that care in everything that we do. OK, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope that that has been interesting. I just want to thank some of my collaborators that I've mentioned throughout. Um, and just a reminder of my email address and my Twitter. I'm really happy to send any of the papers that I've talked about. I'm happy to share those or answer any questions um, at a later date as well. Or I'm also happy to take some questions now if anybody would like to ask anything. Thank you. Just to let the people know, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says Q&A. And now's the, now's the time to click the Q&A.
and type up your question there. And it looks like we got one question right now just popped up here. So uh, please uh, reflect on the presentation and I will uh, take that first question here. Okay, so let me just open it up here. Okay, this question is from, and I apologize if I pronounced it incorrectly. The question is from uh, Sadridan. Sadridan says, thank you for this amazing presentation. One thing I have noticed is that men who attempt to report misconduct by women against them not only risk not being believed by those in authority, but quickly find that feminist women will gang up against them for daring to bring their allegations forward. You go from one abuser in your life to an army attacking you. How common is this and what can be done about it? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't necessarily think that the way in which I see the point that's been made there, absolutely, that actually when men do attempt to seek help and support from an abusive relationship, they face a number of battles in terms of trying to get there. So there are a number of barriers like I've discussed already. But it does include the fact that there is still a real resistance to accepting and understanding men's victimization in society and um, so I, I can recognize that actually those barriers that I face like within the data that I have there are men that have talked about calling the police and being laughed at or being told that they must have provoked it or what did you do to deserve that or are you sure that you didn't start it like I say, all being accused of being the perpetrator, being referred to a perpetrator program. And so this for me creates this idea of secondary victimization, where you are already vulnerable, you've already been victimized, and you go and access help and support for that, and you experience further victimization as a consequence. So the services again victimize you in that way. So it's a really it's a real issue, actually, the fact that people don't um don't always get that help and support because they're not always believed still. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, please type in. Uh, please type in your questions. So I have a question now. So I actually just brought up information about your talk to a senior colleague of mine, and she, the, the senior colleague was quite disparaging and not even quite believing that this was an issue. And I think the response was something along the lines of, "Well, it happens so infrequently. Why is a woman speaking up about this? It's just not right." And I'm curious if you've come across comments like that or how would oh, yeah. you, um, ex you know, how would you, how did you respond and how would you suggest that others respond when even opening up the discussion or highlighting a talk like this was kind of met with like your sexist for even suggesting that this talk occur? Yeah, I've had very, very similar. So I've, um, I've been doing this for... 10 11 years now um, and I've had comments like that all the way through and um, there is so it comes from a range of different things really I mean I would say to defend I mean not that I need to defend it because the evidence I have evidence of this um, but like the office for national statistics in the UK suggests that one in three victims are male so that equates to 757,000 men are victims of domestic violence so that's to me not infrequent um, the stories that they share, the, the the things men have shared with me, there is no way that it is isolated or in the low numbers that people talk about. It's, the evidence is just there that it is a really significant issue. I think that one of the things that um, I face and feel the need to say um, is that sometimes there's a perception that because I want to highlight the issue for men or that I want to get help and support for men sometimes there's this perception that I want to in any way take away from women like it shouldn't be given to women it should be given to men instead and I am most categorically that is not the case there is not enough resources there are not enough resources or help and support for women at all definitely not definitely not for men but still definitely not for women either but we need to be able to make sure that there is an equality of opportunity to get access to that, which at the moment men don't have. So I'm used to that sort of criticism and I'm used to that sort of perception. But for me, I'm advocating for evidence-based practice. So all of this evidence that I've just talked through needs to be taken into consideration when we're making decisions about allocations of policy, uh, sorry, allocations of funding or policy decisions. Um, 
And some of the stuff, like I've been, because I've written as well, and this has also not been popular, but I've written as well about the fact that the Duluth-based feminist gendered models of domestic violence that inform the perpetrator programs like the Duluth program, they're not effective. The evidence does not support that they're effective. And that's not me saying let's not work with violent men. It's saying we need to work with them in a much more evidence-based way because ultimately that will help protect women. So for me, I'm just about working in an evidence-based, gender-inclusive and gender-responsive way because for me, it feels like the only way in which we're ever going to tackle this issue. Sorry, that was a really long answer. Great. No, it answered my question. And uh, wonderfully, we have four more questions pop up. So let me turn to the audience. The next question is from Alexandra. Alexandra says, great presentation. I'm wondering about the role of empathy or rather its lack in perceiving and helping victims who happen to be men, especially amongst the psychologists and social workers who are supposed to help those who need it. Hi, Sasha, thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a there is definitely a lack of empathy um, or a lack of sympathy, empathy. I don't know which word it is really, but there is a, a much less concern about men and I think it's it plays back to some of those stereotypes that we've talked about where we think that men can look after themselves so the masculine gender role and the gender norms that surround it point to the fact that men should be able to defend themselves that women aren't big enough and strong enough to hurt men um, that men need to be emotionally resilient to not be emotional to be stoic and to be sort of unemotional and to just get on with it and take care of it and protect and look after people and so I think that all of this plays into a little bit the fact that we then when men are experiencing this it's almost like we don't care as much is one of my you know just a hypothesis really I don't have specific evidence about that but um there's a couple of psychologists in the UK um, John Barry and Martin Seeger who were the founding members of the British Psychological Society Male Psychology Section, um, which I'm currently chair of and um, just become chair of um, and they talk about there being an empathy gap an empathy gap when it comes to not just domestic violence, but a number of issues that affect men. It includes things like health and mental health and looking at things like suicide as well. But there is a sort of empathy gap that exists around men and talking about these issues. So I think that that's a really good point that you've raised there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from, let's see here, um, Lauren. Lauren says, Thank you so much, Dr. Bates. What a wonderful presentation. Similar to issues being raised already, what challenges do you think a cisgender male researcher might face when they are to present similar research findings? I guess it's kind of getting at there might be a privilege involved by not being a cisgendered white male in presenting this information. I have can't specifically answer that because I don't know. Um, I do and have... I feel like, although I can't articulate exactly why, but I do feel like it's easier for me to say these things because I'm a woman. Um, I think that the it's possible the empathy, sympathy thing we were just talking about maybe plays into it, whereby a man talking about this, it's not taken as seriously. Um, but, I, but I don't know. That's just, you know, it's something I've, pro it's definitely something I've felt and it's definitely something I've acknowledged before that for me as a woman doing this, it is easier than I imagine it would be for a man. But um, but again, I'm just, as, ever, as everybody is, I hope, following the evidence. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Felicity. Felicity says, do the findings from your research suggest that men benefit from similar types of interventions as women do? Oh, good question, Felicity. Um, the little evidence that there is, yes. Um, the sort of stuff that is starting to, um, so there's a, a range of different sort of um, evidence bases that are developing around this. Um, but the victim services paper that I referred to before, um, me and Emily Douglas did this review of the way in which victim services um, were serving what we called underserved populations in the UK and the US. And it was off the back of a, an earlier review that had been done as part of the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge, where Christopher Eckhart et al. had done a review about victim services and how effective they were and stuff. Um, and his conclusion at the time had been that there aren't enough 
evidence-based explorations of um, services for men and interventions for men in terms of being victims and that support. And we did our review and concluded there still isn't enough, there still are not enough investigations of this issue. So the evidence that there is suggests that yes, definitely, therapeutic interventions, um, social support and being able to offer that sort of element of that is really important. Um, interestingly, some of the research that's looked at the effectiveness of refuge and shelter and safe accommodation and how that impacts on women alongside therapeutic um, interventions, that that part of being in that group safe space, is, it can be an important element of that. But that's not something we can currently really explore as, in as much detail for men because there are not as many um, opportunities for men to be able to have safe accommodation like that. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question from Edward. Fascinating work. I'm wondering about if much is known about the frequency of bi-directional domestic violence. Are male victims of violence more likely to commit violence themselves? I imagine this might be the default intuitive hypothesis, which could contribute to a lack of empathy towards male victims. Do you know if any numbers exist to quantify these proportions? Um, that's a really good question. Um, bidirectional violence, according to the academic research, <coughs> is the most common type of domestic violence. So the academic research, this isn't captured as well in the crime surveys, but the academic research suggests that around 50% of domestic domestically violent relationships are bidirectionally violent. Um, and then that the other 25% is male only and the other 25% is female only within heterosexual relationships. Um, I definitely think you have a point there about the assumption being that some of the male victims are um, also perpetrators and that there is that bi-directionality. Um, I asked that question within my survey to try and capture that because for me, male, a man's experience is a man's experience. It doesn't matter whether he has also been a perpetrator in that sense to understand what his victimization is, albeit I definitely understand that it is a separate, not separate, but a differentiated um, experience. But within my sample, 67% um, had never, um, never ever hit their partner or retaliated in any way. Um, and even within the accounts of the men that said they had, um, I would say another, I'd say half of the ones that said they have-ish hadn't used what I would term violence. They'd sort of held her when she was trying to assault him. So she maybe held her back and maybe that had left a bruise. And so they'd said that that was violence. But for me, that's that's not the same thing. Um, so I suppose, in a word, again, a wordy answer to your question. Yes, um, some of the men will be also um, perpetrators within these bi-directionally violent relationships. And yes, I do think there is an assumption that male victims are also perpetrators. But again, from the, from the proportions within the literature and the, my own data, it's not a majority by any stretch of the imagination. Great, thank you. Uh... Next question uh, from Linda. Thank you, that was amazing. Have you found in your research that men are comfortable to receive support from females, even though they've been victims of female perpetrators? Hi, Linda. Really good question. And um, that's a really interesting question, actually, because a lot of the women's sector that works with women, some organizations only employ women to create a safe environment for women in that way. Um, the Mankind Initiative Helpline is all staffed by women. Um, and what we found, I mean, one of the things that there is in terms of like the presence of people like IDFAs and support staff within the sector for men is that men often don't have a choice. Um, but actually where men are offered a choice, they're often not bothered, um, which is quite, it's just, it's quite an interesting finding because I, again, you would assume based on some of the way in which the women's sector work or often, to be fair, the way women feel as well, that women, men wouldn't want to then work with women. But that's not been the case. That's not been the case that I've seen where there is a proportion that may prefer to work with men. Um, unfortunately, that is not something that is always facilitated in some areas. There is like only one idfa that will work with men and he's a man or a woman. Well, he's, he's either a man or a woman or, you know, somebody identifies in a different way um, on that just that one person so there's no choice that that's the person or they don't have a person so I think the choice is actually an important part of that really I think that there should be a choice um but yeah in answer to your question actually interestingly no there's not that preference great uh next question from Elijah thank you for this very interesting talk 
I've understood that about 40% of domestic abusers meet criteria for borderline personality disorder. It sure seems like that figure may differ based on the gender of the abuser, though, and that disorder is highly gendered. In line with that, is that in line with your research and experience? That's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't worked with the perpetrators, so I can't really comment on that. Um, I know that from the data that I've got, some men did talk about personality disorders in their partners, um, only quite a small proportion. Um, it makes me think of um, Don Dutton's book, The Abusive Personality, which talked about borderline traits and anxious attachment styles and the way in which that created a cycle of abuse for men. He worked with men in that case, whereby men are frightened of being abandoned and so sort of cling to their partner where there's conflict they then lash out they're then absolutely horrifically guilty and feel awful about it and then are frightened of being abandoned again and it creates this sort of cycle and um, there's been less explored of that for women but where I think that it has been explored I think there is support of a similar sort of um, abusive personality in that same sort of way for some women I think that one of the things I'm really cautious about is that and um, because what I've really noticed within some of the area is that when we talk about men male victimization there's a lot of talk about narcissistic women and a lot of um, men in not in my data specifically, but like on Twitter um, and in the, sort of the, the wider narrative on it. I know a lot of men have talked about women. They're part of being narcissistic. They must be narcissistic. They've got a narcissistic personality disorder. But actually, the evidence of that is not is not particularly strong. And I'm really um, I'm always really cautious about any sort of generalization about that. Because what I would say in terms of, if I was to generalise in terms of the way in which we can predict perpetration um, or predict factors of perpetration, I suppose, is that sort of consistently childhood trauma and adverse childhood experiences are incredibly influential in that. Um, so there may be borderline, there may be narcissism, there may be sort of pockets of it, but there's no sort of one personality that is more... Um, more likely to do this than another I would say but I have I, as I say I work with victims not perpetrators so I don't really have the evidence for that. Great. Okay uh, the next is actually a comment not a question but it's actually a comment in regards to one of the previous uh, questioners so I'll just read the comment out just to put it in the room and uh, you know if you don't want to respond because it's not really directed at you you're happy to let me tell me to move on so, uh, so and I apologize if I mentioned the name correctly Sadridan, Sadridan, I'm going to assume that he's referring to Doc to Lauren Prupis's to Lauren's quote. Um, I can answer the question just asked, but I, I think it's from a question asked long ago. I dared to do a poster that touches on these issues at a professional meeting. I was fired from my job, bullied out of several professional societies, and remained blacklisted in my profession. So I'm assuming he's speaking about Lauren's question about you know a man or a cisgender man presenting this sort of research or information. Um, that's horrific. Um, I, it, I don't, I can't comment on that obviously specifically. Um, although I do know that Murray Strauss, when he first started, um, well, not when he first started, when his body of evidence grew, I know that he had death threats and all sorts. I know Erin Pizze, who was, um, she opened the first, it was a women's refuge at the time in the 70s in the UK. Um, but she very quickly realised it was a, that the women that were coming were also violent, so that it was actually violent families that they were talking about, a lot of bi-directional violence. Um, and when she then tried to talk about that and tried to actually raise, actually, we need to help the families, not just the women, um, she received death threats, she received horrific abuse. So there, there's been some very toxic behaviour within the sector um, across the years. Okay, um, okay next question uh, from Agnieszka. I might have pronounced that incorrectly. Great presentation. Did you notice that? Did you notice that male victims of domestic abuse use different coping strategies than female victims? Good question, Aga. Um, yes, I think so. Not not consistently across the board, but I do notice differences. Um, I think that where women. And again, these are very broad generalisations, so forgive that. But I think where women have utilised social support and more sort of being able to confide in friends and family, um, men don't seem to do that as much, although friends and family do tend to be the first person that they will disclose to about that. Um, but I think it takes them a lot longer to do that. Um, I know from some of the men that I've worked with that they talked about um, having conversations 
with um, their friends, excuse me, where it was, they were sort of floating the idea of it rather than saying this has happened to me. It was like, oh yeah, I know this guy and this happened. And dependent on their reaction would then affect how they were then going to talk about it. Although I imagine to some degree that's quite similar in women as well. Um, but again, I suppose related to the coping strategies around the health stuff I mentioned before, where um, men will sometimes externalise their distress so maybe more likely to take up um more like drink more and, and take drugs and stuff like that where women may have different coping strategies but it's a really good question and it'd be quite a good one to explore actually okay um thank you we did not get to all the questions uh, it is one o'clock so i'm going to just put the web address back in the chat here oops sorry put the wrong thing here uh if you go to the chat um, there is a uh, link there. If you wish to participate in some small group discussion around this uh, talk, you're welcome to click that link now and I will open up that Zoom room in about a minute. Uh, depending on how many people come, sometimes we have up to three rooms or if it's just four or five people, we just sort of have one big discussion. So if you're interested, please uh, go ahead and uh, click that link. Otherwise, uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for attending the latest speaker in the Confronting Hegemonic Idea speaker series. Uh, we have our next speaker next month, Dr. Joanna Moncrief, and is looking at the myth of the chemical cure, in which she actually looks at psychiatric drugs, not correcting chemical imbalances, but actually causing them is the focus of her talk. So you're welcome to attend that as well. With that said, let me again express my appreciation to you, Dr. Bates. It is, uh, what time is it there now? Yeah, nine at nine o'clock at night, 9 PM. hence why I've gone from daylight to darkness. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for accommodating our schedule here on the... Uh, no, thank West you for Coast inviting me. Okay, again, thank you very much. I'm going to close the session off, so if you need to click that link or copy it, please do it immediately. And I will be sticking around, so I hope to see some people over on the other side. Thank you. Okay, bye.